Good morning, church. It's my privilege to share with you what I believe is on God's heart. He wants to put it into your heart. There are some scriptures that we have to have to first consider. One is all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. The second is that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Thirdly, that God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. But my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways broader than yours. Scripture declares that God is a holy God, a just God, a righteous God, a God who desires to bless his people. A God who desires his people to obey his commands. Where did the fear of the Lord or fear first have its start? If we read the Genesis account where God created all things and after he created all things, he said all things are good. Then he created man and woman, placed them in the garden. Everything that he created is there to bless them. They would tend it, and they would be, have dominion over it. But there was a serpent, a strange, a strange serpent in that garden that caused man to sin. And with that sin came fear. Because Adam was in the garden and he heard the voice of God before the sin, before he fell. And he wasn't afraid of God. They had fellowship in the garden together. But after they fell, after they disobeyed God and took the, the tree that God forbid them to take of, and they received the knowledge of good and evil, Then God, they heard God's voice walking in the garden. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Finally, Adam says, I heard your voice and I hid myself because I was naked. I was afraid. That's the first mention of fear in the Bible. And I believe that because of the original sin, fear came on all men. And the fear was both of fear of God and fear of men. Well, God chose a special people and he led them out of Egypt. He did miraculous things before them. He sent all the plagues on, on the Egyptians to break them down to allow his people to go. The final one was the Passover lamb that was put on the doorposts to keep the deaf spirit from coming into their house. Today, that, tra that Passover lamb is transported into our teaching that Jesus Christ is the Passover of God. Well, God led them with fear fearful signs through the desert in a cloud of fire and a cloud during the day and a fire at night. Such fearfulness that it kept the Egyptians away from them. They recognized that God was with them. And he took them through the sea. He spread the seas wide open so that they could walk through on dry ground. A fearful and wonderful thing that God did. Then he led them to a mountain. And he says, I'm going to come down on that mountain. I want you to place a barrier around the mountain and I don't want the people to come there because if they do... They will die 
if they cross that barrier. So God came down in a thick, dark cloud and lightning and flashings, and they actually heard the voice of God speaking to them out of that cloud and telling Moses the Ten Commandments. And God himself wrote on those tablets with his own finger those commandments. And by those commandments, God would direct his people for the rest of their lives. And it was important that they learn these commandments and teach them to their children, children, children. So that they would have the fear of God in them as well. And it wasn't only the commandments that they were supposed to teach their children when they laid down, when they sat, when they walked. Whenever they would be together, they were to teach their children these things. The commandments, the Ten Commandments of the Lord. We all know them. We have learned them from our childhood. These commandments give us instructions on how we can live with God and with people. They give us guidelines on how our lives should, should be. This would then help us to fear the Lord. This would lead us in a way where we would reverence our God. And we do honor him to him. We praise him. We lift him up. God said when he gave these things, he says, you shall serve no other God before me, for I am a jealous God. And they knew it well. Well, God instructed them that they should continually teach these things to their children, children's, children's, children throughout all generations. Are we part of that generation? Yeah, we are. Are we supposed to know what God has done for them is also important to us? Yeah, because in knowing that, we too would have the ability to know who God is and what he wants to do for our lives. The songs that we sang this morning in the discussion in Sunday school that we had, all are part of the fear of God. But you know what God and Spirit is saying today in a lot of churches? Where is my fear and where is my reverence? Who have you come to listen to? Have you come to listen to man or you have come to listen to what I say unto you? See, the word of God is his word from the beginning, a foundation of this world. And it's been settled in his mind forever. Those Ten Commandments were needed in the Old Testament for the Jewish people to have that relationship with God. They also were used to give the direction for the kings and the priests in their judgments that they would issue to the people. They are the standard which we do our judgments if someone sins against us. We look to this standard for our judgments. The king himself was supposed to write a copy of these commandments for himself and to read it every day when he ruled. And the priests were to make copies for themselves and read it every day when they ruled. In fact, on the seventh Feast of Tabernacles, every seven years, when all the people were called, caused by God to come together, gather together before him 
in, and his tabernacle. The priests were to rehearse the laws and the commandments to the people so that they would continue to fear the Lord. If they did not do that, then God's blessings would not be there for them. Brothers and sisters, there is a blessing in the fear of the Lord. There is a blessing that comes from, from knowing God in a very personal way and obeying what he commands you to do. Sometimes he'll just speak to you in your heart and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. God is a personal God. Those Ten Commandments, when Christ came, he had the spirit of fear of God in him. If you read in Isaiah chapter 11, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. For Israel... Those Ten Commandments were also their wisdom, their knowledge, and their understanding. If you're to read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, or chapter 4, excuse me, it says that this will be your wisdom, this will be your knowledge. And the nations around you, therefore to observe them, for this is your wisdom, in verse 4, verse 6. It's your understanding in the sight of peoples who shall hear these statutes and say, this is other people saying it now, surely this great nation is wise and an understanding people. For well, what great nation is there that God is so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. What great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all of this law which I set before you today? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen lest you depart from the, your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. God is interested in each one of us in a very personal way. I believe that this, the laws that God did on God on Horeb, Mount Horeb translate into abiding in the vine in our New Testament. Christ said this. He says, the words that I speak, the things that I do are not mine, but it is the Father's. So if God is the same yesterday and today and forever, what he said on Mount Horeb would also apply in the New Testament. Jesus also said this. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy spirit and mind. And love your neighbor as thyself. In these two commands is all the law and the prophets fulfilled. When Jesus was 
at the Lord's Supper, he gave another command. He said this. A a new command I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So if we love one another like Christ loved us, and if we love the Father with all our heart and all our mind and all our spirit, and if we love our neighbor as ourselves, are we not also obeying the Ten Commandments that were in the Old Testament? Are not the other books of the Bible in the New Testament explaining a lot of what happens in the in these laws, how we deal with people, how we deal with God? Are not all the scriptures important unto us? Can we take these out of the Old Testament and throw them away and say, they don't apply to me? Well, let's check a few of those things out. Proverbs 3. Five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct his path. Is that true? Is that not showing fear of the Lord? Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he will direct your paths. Psalm 37. What does God have to say about those who don't follow him? I want to take you to Malachi chapter 3. How important is God call the fear of the Lord? Why is it important to him? In Malachi chapter 3, we find the people and the priesthood saying these things against God. God says this to them, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken against you? You have said it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances? And what have we, why have we walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up, even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before them for those who fear the Lord and and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son. Then they shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. See, that happened in in a religious setting. Is that not happening today? Are there people saying, well, why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to give money to the poor? Why do I have to do this? Why do I? I don't think it's speaking to me. But God is saying, listen, church. Listen what I say. Where is my fear? Where is my reverence? Are you bowing down to me in your heart? The word is very important in our lives. In Psalm 119, (laughs) wow, that was awesome to have 119 up there. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
Wherewithal can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to the word of God? These are very important promises in the word. I'll read you some of the promises that God has about those who do fear him. There's many of those in, in Proverbs and many of those in Psalms. I'll read Psalm 31, 19. How great is the goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy. This is kind of nice. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of God encamps about them that fear him and delivereth them. How many of you have ever been in an accident and you wondered how you got out of it? And it's been my experience to experience that deliverance. Quite a while back, I was on my way with my family to a, a religious meeting. I was driving a, a Ford van, one-ton van. I had all my children, my six children with me. And I was going down High Woman 100. This is old High Woman 100. Going off on to the exit on 55. So coming down the exit on 55 is going 50 miles an hour off the exit onto 55. A car cut right in front of me. My van stopped in 10 feet. My kids sitting went like this. That's all. To this day, I, I think God sent an angel who are sent forth from him to minister to those who are heirs of his kingdom. If it wasn't for that angel, I think we'd be all dead. You cannot stop a, a one-ton vehicle going 50 miles an hour in 10 feet. It's literally and physically impossible. Even if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, you're traveling at 30 feet per second per second. So is God's word true? Is his promises true? I believe that one there was. In verse 9 of 34, Fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them who fear him. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. God is saying this to us. Be still, and this is in 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. And I will be exalted among the heathen, and I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 89, 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints hmm, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. We're told in scripture that wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. Do we realize that God is in our presence when we fear him? You think he's here just to sit. He's here to act on your behalf. He's here to listen to what you're saying. He's here to see who fears him and acts that way in their life.
Then the scripture says, serve the Lord and fear him only. Proverbs has loads of promises in it. But I want, I want to first take you to Psalm 34. And we're going to look at what a person who fears the Lord does. Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. O oh, taste and see, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want for those who fear him. Who is a man who desires life? Verse 12. And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue for evil. Your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. If you want to see what God considers a wicked person, I trust that none of this is in your life. I'm going to take you to Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgressions, transgressions of the wicked. One, there is no fear before his eyes, the fear of God before his eyes. He flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and, he hate, and when he hates the word of his mouth, our wickedness and deceit, he has ceased to be wise and do good. He divides wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Those things God hates. In Romans chapter 1, we're, we're told that God reveals himself to men. And some men, although they knew who God was from his creation, did not give honor, God honor, nor, nor fear him. So God gave them over to a retrobate mind to do all sorts of things. And those are the same things that are mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. The works of the flesh. Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the like which I tell you beforehand. God wants us to Fear him in all of our ways. To acknowledge him in all the things that we do. To show that we trust him 
Our confidence is not in men. It's not in the government. It's not in our armies. It's not in ourselves. But our confidence is totally in God, who knows me infinitely. He formed me in the womb. He set all things in motion in my life. He knows my ups, my downs. He knows me personally. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to show you things that you've never seen before. I have not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. There are many other things that I, I studied. Many things that God wanted me to understand and to help you to understand. See, he wants you to know him in all that he is, in all that he provides. The psalm says there's no lack of them who fear him. Well, that's true. Because in First Peter, or Second Peter chapter one, it says God has given us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Christ. See, if we abide in the mountain over here, then we are under the law, and we have to obey every single one of them, or we are guilty of every one. If we miss one, we're guilty of everything that God said. But over here, under Christ, we've come to a new mountain. Christ. All things are in God and in Christ. All things are in God and all things are in Christ. If we obey Christ and abide in him, we are under the grace of God and not under the law. But everything is over there does apply to us. But grace does not replace the law. The law shows us that we need God's grace. Does that make sense? There is a way that seemeth right unto man but the end thereof is death. If we ought to know God's way, it says, those that fear him, God gives them his secrets. He even reveals the secret things. How many want to know the secrets of God? How many want to know what God's will for your life is? How many of you want to see your loved ones in heaven? There's a requirement. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He was that passer of sacrifice over here that they got out of Egypt with got to the mountain where they got the commandments and that turned into their righteousness. Christ over here, the Passover lamb, died so we could have his righteousness. His grace, his mercy, his peace. It's all in the vine. You either abide in those commandments over there 
and receive the righteousness of God in your life, or you receive Christ over here under grace because of God's love. You've all heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am come to do the Father's will. The Father's will is that Christ would surrender his life to set you free from the law of sin and death and put you under the law of grace, mercy, and peace. What it requires is that you hear the word. It produces faith in your life. You confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. God raised from the dead says you shall be saved. What is the fear of the Lord? Today, being in Christ. Obeying Christ. Obeying the word of God. It's our instruction in righteousness. It's our instruction in life. Father God, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that your presence is here. Jesus, you said that wherever two or three are gathered, you'd be in the midst. And I thank you that the angels of God are encamped about us because we fear you. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And Father, you provided all things for us through Christ. You gave us the law, so you show us that we can't live by the law. We have to live through the shed blood of Christ. You gave us your peace through Christ. We've strayed, Father. We've gone our own way. But you laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. If you're in a place you want to know God's in a very close personal way and you want to walk in the fear of the Lord then pray this prayer with me. Father, I know there's more for me in you. I know that you've given me your word to instruct me in the fear of the Lord. I know that I haven't been walking that way in my life. I've been walking more in the fear of men than the fear of you. And you said, if my ways would please you, that you would make even my enemies be at peace with me. So I'm asking you to guide me, direct me, first forgive me, then guide me and direct me using your word and using people and help me to show others the reverence I have for you and the honor I have for you and the desire to serve you and not men. Open my heart to your word. Open my mind not to reason it out, but to accept it. And lead me in a way that is righteous. 
I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus, and may you serve him with all your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. From whom all blessings flow, praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him. Thank you.